This is Mick Foley, and you are watching C Red TV here, right here on YouTube. Have a nice day. This is Cody Dana, and you are watching C Rad TV on YouTube. And just like Cody Diener, C Rad TV lives by two simple words just give her. How's it going, guys? It's Brad C. Out of WWE Monday Night Raw review from April 22nd, Earth Day Raw. Let's go ahead and jump right into it. So we start off Raw with WWE COO Triple H coming out to the rain. And as Triple H gets in the rain, Seth Rollins' music hits. And then the Universal Champion Seth Rollins comes out to the ring. Of course, Seth gets a standing ovation from the crowd since they are in Seth's home state of Iowa. Not his hometown, though. It, the Raw was in Des Moines, Iowa. Seth's hometown is Davenport, Iowa. Nope. Wrong city that starts with a D. Better luck next time. So Seth comes out. Triple H and Seth both shake hands. And then Seth goes on. He says that standing in his home state as champion is a surreal moment. Yes, it is a surreal moment to be champion in your home state. So then Seth goes on and then says he brought the title back home where it belongs. Um, your home state or Raw? You gotta specify that one. So then Triple H said that Seth has indeed brought the title home. And Triple H says that now after the Superstar shakeup, the landscape has officially changed on both Raw and SmackDown. Then Triple H goes on and says that Seth is now the measuring stick of the Raw division. Since Seth is now the universal title, and now everyone's going to be gunning for him. So then Seth goes on and reminds us all of his two Money in the Bank instances. The instance in 2015, well, 2014 into 2015, where Seth cashed in successfully in the grandest stage of them all, WrestleMania, in the main event. Still the greatest Money in the Bank cash in to this day is Seth Rollins. And then there was 2016 where Seth Rollins beated Roman Reigns for the uni for the WWE title at Wrestle at uh, not Wrestle so Money in the Bank in 2016, and then Dean Ambrose cashed in successfully on Dean on Seth Rollins to win the WWE title. So yeah, those are the two instances. Seth has had a successful cash in, and Seth has been cashed on once. So yeah, Seth's been involved in two Money in the Bank cash ins, and has been on both sides of it. So yeah, and then Triple H goes on and then says that Seth needs to focus on his next title defense, which will be at Money in the Bank in a couple weeks. So then Triple H goes on and tells Seth and everybody that he hasn't got word yet from Paul Heyman or Brock Lesnar. So yeah, Brock is gone? Good. Hope it stays that way. Keep Lesnar's bitch ass out of here. He does not give a shit about the company. He's just a waste of money and a waste of roster space. You can give his spot on the roster to somebody that's more worthy of it. So then Triple H goes on and announces two triple threat matches that will happen tonight. And the winner of both those triple threats will face each other in one-on-one -on -one in the main event. With the winner challenging Seth Rollins for the Universal title at Money in the Bank 2019. So then Samoa Joe's music hits and then the United States Champion Samoa Joe comes out. Yes, Samoa Joe has come to Monday Night Raw as a part of the shakeup. So then Samoa Joe, he comes out, he said, says he does what he wants, when he wants, and then Joe says that his shoulders are big enough that he has room for one more belt on him. Because everyone is now trying to copy the whole Becky 2 belt thing. Since Becky has now made holding two titles at the same time famous. You know, Ultimate Warrior did it before, before it became cool. Same deal with Kurt Angle, and Seth Rollins, and Miz, and the list goes on and on. So then Rey Mysterio's music hits, and Rey Mysterio comes out. And then Rey goes on and says that he came to Raw for the dream match. Seth Rollins versus Rey Mysterio. <laughs> That's it, really? That's all you wanted? I thought you would want more. Damn, that's pathetic. So then Drew McIntyre's music hits and Drew McIntyre comes out. Drew goes on and spent, he says he spent one year cleaning up this division without getting a single opportunity. I mean, you won Raw Tag titles, but I guess you know that doesn't work. But in terms of Universal title opportunities, no, you haven't had one yet. Yet, though. So then Drew goes and says his time is now. 
And then Drew said that Seth is only champ because Seth got to Brock Lesnar before Drew could. And then Drew says once it's all said and done, he'll become Universal Champion. So then Miz's music hits and Miz comes out to the ring. Miz goes on and says that Seth has something he wants. And then Miz goes on and says he can be the man worthy of a Universal title. Yes, you can. It's just it's your time now. Or will Fitz find any excuse possible to not put the belt on you? Take your pick, folks. So then Boring Corbin's music hits, and then Boring Corbin comes out. He gets fucking booed out of the building. Baron goes on and says that he's the most deserving man to have an opportunity at the Universal title. No, you're not. Shut the fuck up. You want, you want to prove that you're worthy? How about you learn more than two goddamn moves? How about that? So then Baron goes on, he asks Drew, Ray, and Miz if they've ever beat a gold medalist in their farewell match. He even asks Samoa Joe that same question. So then AJ Styles' music hits and AJ Styles comes out. So then AJ asks if Baron ever shuts up. AJ, I wish it was that easy. So then AJ goes on and says that Baron's face is, annoy is as annoying as his voice. Oh, uh, no, nah, it's not annoying. He's just boring. Why everyone calls him Boring Corbin. So then AJ goes on and says that at Money in the Bank, it will be Seth Rollins versus AJ Styles. I don't know. I've heard rumors that it's supposed to be AJ Styles versus Seth Rollins at SummerSlam in, in Toronto. We'll have to wait and see, though. That's just a rumor. So then Seth goes on and says that he's ready for everyone because he's Seth freaking Rollins. Yeah, I, I wished it was Seth fucking Rollins, but this is a PG show, and we can't have nice things like that. So anyway, then continuing on, we get to our first triple threat number one contenders match. Rey Mysterio versus AJ Styles versus Samoa Joe. Highlights of the match, Joe's strikes are pretty good. Um, Rey's drop kick was good along with his head scissor. AJ's backbreaker was pretty good, too, along with a sliding knee on the apron and his backbreaker. Ray's sunset flip head scissor was pretty impressive, too, along with Samoa Joe's Yurinagi and his power slam. AJ's Insiguri was good, too, along with Ray's bulldog and leg sweep. Ray's corkscrew drive was also good. Um, Joe's avalanche overhead back double back body drop to AJ and Ray from the top rope was pretty good, too. Ray's seat of senton was good along with his back arm drag drop. I'm not sure what the hell that was. Ray's head scissor was also good too along with his tornado DDT. Samoa Joe would lock in two coquina clutches, one on AJ and one on Ray. AJ's payway kick was good too along with Ray's head scissor. Ray's 619 was good too. AJ would then hit two power bombs to Ray with the second power bomb being on top of Samoa Joe. A match ending. AJ hits the Styles Clash on Rey Mysterio with Rey landing right on top of Samoa Joe. AJ gets the three count on Joe for the win. So Joe is the cushion for AJ's finisher. And Joe's the one that takes the loss. Interesting. Because, well, I think we all knew AJ was going to win this match because Samoa Joe versus Rey Mysterio is still going to be a feud. Maybe this time the match will last long, no, longer than one minute. See, on this instance, AJ just happened to be the last man standing in all this. But yeah, AJ advances to the main event. Later on in night, we'll get to that in a little bit. So, next up, we get a one-on-one -on -one women's match. We get Naomi versus one half of the women's tag team champions, the Iconics, Billy Kay. So, before the match, both Billy and Payne would go on and they'd mock Ariana Grande's song, Thank You, Next. Oh, look, we're mocking celebrities now. That's really going to get the views up. And I was being sarcastic there. In case nobody saw the sign. So a couple highlights in this match. Naomi's jawbreaker and Insiguri was good. Matt Jenny Naomi does a sunset roll up on Billy Kay. Naomi gets the three count for the win. So really so far. They've really made Billy and Payne look like weak champions. Like they've made. Like their only title defense was against local jobbers. And every time they faced a real tag team, they've got their asses kicked. Well, it's like, well, we asked for real competition, and they keep getting their asses kicked to become a punching bag. 
But yeah, maybe it's time we make Billy and Payne more relevant. Have to wait and see, though. So continuing on, next up, our next matchup is the second triple threat match. We have The Miz versus Baron Corbin versus Drew McIntyre. Highlights of the match, John Smith's springboard hanging dropkick was good along with Drew's standing suplex. Uh, Miz's eight kicks in the corner was good along with his two running double knees. Uh, Miz's running clothesline in the corner was good too along with his double axe handles to both Baron and Drew. Miz's hit kicks on the middle of the ring were good too. Drew's Glasgow kiss was good. Um, Drew's avalanche white noise followed by a Baron's um, power bomb to Drew from the top rope pretty good too. Baron, you've won, only learned one move off circumstance. You got to do better than that. Uh, continuing on, Miz's double diving clothesline was good along with Drew's reverse Alabama slam. Miz's double leg fall by the leg figure four was good. Drew was would break up the figure four with a poke to the eye while the ref wasn't looking. Um, Drew, it's a triple threat match. Um, you can get away with poking him in the eye because in a triple threat there are no disqualifications or countouts. So Drew's poke to the eye was legal. I don't know why they drew, they had they need to have Drew do it while the ref wasn't looking when it's 100% legal. So then Baron goes, hits a deep six. There's a kick out at two. Baron then goes and throws a temper tantrum to the ref. So Baron Corbin embraces his inner Kylo Ren. Drew's spine buster was good along with Miz's two DDTs. Match ending, Drew hits the Claymore on Miz. Baron then goes and pushes Drew out of the ring. Baron Corbin gets the three count on the Miz for the win. So Baron Corbin advances to the main event. Because I guess they're going to have Miz versus Drew McIntyre feud too, maybe. I'm not sure. We'll have to wait and see. And Baron happened to be the last man standing. Mm. So yeah. Baron advances to face AJ Styles. We'll get to that match in a little bit. So next up, Sami Zayn comes out. To the ring, we then go to commercial break. Once we come back, WWE then goes and plays the promo for the Make-A-Wish Foundation. We're just going to skip that promo because I could give zero fucks about Make-A-Wish. Um, I don't hate the foundation. I just really don't care about it on a wrestling show. When we got a segment, we got to get to. So we have Sami Zayn in the ring. Sami goes on and says that the WWE Universe always acts negative to hide themselves. What the fuck are we hiding ourselves from, Sami? We're hiding nothing about how much of a dumpster fire this company is. I don't know what you're do talking about. Sammy Duggan goes on and says that he hasn't been bitter and says that anyone that has said he's been bitter while he's gone is a, it's a false narrative. So Sammy is pulling his inner Donald Trump and is saying that anyone that says Sammy is bitter is fake news. So Sammy goes on and he says that he's enjoyed his 10 months out of, out of action. And then Sammy goes on and shows his Instagram photos of all his his 10 months on vacation to different places. Uh, one of the photos, Sammy had a gigantic smile on it. And then Sammy says to zoom in on that smile and everyone to take a look at his smile. Um, that's how you normally smile, Sammy. It's nothing new. Everyone smiles. I don't know what the big deal is about a smile. It's like, it's just a smile. Everybody smiles. See? I'm smiling right now. Not that hard. So then Sammy says when he returned back, came back to the WWE, he became depressed. Because Sammy knows he's just going to get wasted again. What, Sammy Zayn will be the next Kofi Kingston and it'll take him 11 years to win a WWE title. Just watch. I'll laugh my ass off if it becomes half that length. So then Sammy goes on and calls everyone in the locker room egomaniacs and delusional. What? So then Sammy goes on and says that the WWE creative of everyone that runs the show backstage are not the problem. And then Sammy once again blames says the WWE Universe is the problem with why WWE is struggling right now. And that the universe has caused a toxic environment. Sammy, once again, I'm going to say it here. It is not the fans' fault this company is a poorly run gong show. Jesus Christ, it's the same fucking shit with Sammy every goddamn week. 
God damn it. We should just skip these segments and just play last week. So Sammy goes on. He tells the WWE Universe to boo him to feel better. Oh, Sammy, so you're just trying to go for the cheap pop now. Going for the cheap pop, huh? And then Sammy goes on and says that the WWE Universe is responsible. No, we're not, dumb shit. No, we're not. We're not responsible for a company being a gong show. That's on creative and management for their incompetent decisions. We ain't responsible for the record low ratings. Fuck out of here. And then Sammy says that the negativity won't keep everyone safe from Sammy. Oh, so I'm not guess I'm not safe from Sammy. Sammy's gonna come to my house and come kick my ass. Wonderful. Since so Sammy says that he'd rather be anywhere than depressed Iowa. And then Sammy suggests that everyone should take a vacation. That one I actually agree with. I think everyone should take vacations. I mean, we're getting close to vacation season, like summer's only a couple months away. And you know, summertime's coming. So yeah, maybe everyone should take a vacation. And then Sammy Zane once again says that he'll see everyone in hell. And then Sammy leaves. Hmm. Honestly, this is just going to be a weekly theme where Sammy's going to blame the WWE Universe for why the company is a shithole. When in reality, we know that's not true. Sorry, Sammy. You can't fool us that easily. You're going to have to try harder than that. So next up, we get a one-on-one -on -one match. We get Cedric Alexander, who has been officially freed from that dumpster fire called the Cruiserweight Division. The piss break, more likely the piss break division. And in his debut match, he takes on the bar's Cesaro, because it looks like in the shake-up, the bar has officially split up. With Sheamus remaining on SmackDown and Cesaro going to Raw. So I guess Cesaro becomes the one-on-one -on -one competitor again. Can Cesaro please become a world champion? I can dream, damn it. So upper highlights of the match. Cesaro's uppercuts were good. Um, Cedric's head scissor and drop kick was good. Cesaro's body slam was also good along with his tilt the world backbreaker. Cesaro's gut red suplex is good. Um, Cedric with buffs the sunset flip. It just looked like absolute dog shit. It's like, what the fuck was that? Cedric's lake sweep fall by a drop kick was pretty good along with his Shinoki driver. Cedric's springboard in Sagiri was good along with his cannonball dive. Matt Jennings Cesaro would go for, hit an uppercut on Cedric while Cedric was in midair going for a crossbody. Cesaro gets the three count for the win. Uh, so it looks like Cedric's just going to probably be a job or, or the lower card. Because when you lose your first match like that. I uh, don't know. Does this mean Cedric becomes a jobber? We're going to have to wait and see. But continuing on, next up we get to a tag team match. We get the Viking Raiders, formerly the Viking Experience, Eric and Ivar. Because you know that whole Viking Experience name? Turns out everybody hated that name, including me. And Vince McMahon decided to change it. Because the fans want, because we all wanted them to be called the War Raiders. But Vince hates it because anything close to remote, anything remotely close to good... Vince will automatically hate and change it to something we all hate. That's just a the theme of WWE. Anything that's close to remotely good, we have to get rid of it. Like Evolution. It was a good pay-per-view last year. And now it's being scrapped because it was good last year. <sighs> makes sense. Actually makes no sense, but it makes sense in Vince's perfect world. So yeah, during this whole thing, Vince decided that their new tag team name will be the Viking Raiders. So he's combining the War Raiders and Viking Experience into one name. So in Durham's, this is what it's called, meeting down the middle. So this is the situation where everybody should win. Except the PC fanboys that will still want to get triggered over it and be like, Ugh, that's not PC, that's not War Raiders, it's Viking, it's not, it's not War Raiders. It's like, shut up, it's the middle. Honestly, I'd rather take Viking Raiders over Viking Experience any day of the week. Fighting Experience is a fucking stupid nickname. So, Viking Raiders take on the Wucha House Party, Kalisto, Grandma Tawik, and Lince Dorado. Before a match, the Raiders would go and attack the Luchas for pre-match assault. Eric hits the Powerbomb Power Slam combo. And the Raiders then finish it off by hitting the pop-up Power Slam on Lince Dorado. 
And oh, by the way, they're now calling that pop-up power slam the Viking Experience. How ironic. So they're going to take their old name, and now it's going to be their finishing name move name. How fucking ironic, huh? Good shit. So yeah, this is really meeting down the middle. So next up, um, Raw and SmackDown Women's Champion Becky Lynch comes out. Said Becky goes and says that there's something in the air. I don't smell anything, Becky. You're going to have to be more specific. Sam Becky goes and says that shakeups create new opportunities. Yes, they do, Becky. Yes, they do. Sam Becky goes on and says that she didn't mind being sucker punched by Lacey Evans last week because Becky says she would sometimes throw a sucker punch or two. At least you're being honest. Sam Becky goes on and calls Lacey a beat bleached blonde. Oh, you didn't call her a weirdo or a dope. You're getting better now. It's like Becky Lynch watched my review last week where I criticized her for being with her weak-ass insults of dopes and weirdos. And now Becky is starting to come up with new clever name-calling insults. Good job, Becky. You're at least trying to learn. Unlike Lacey Evans, who's just going to keep calling people nasties, but... Not much I can do to fix that one. At least I, at least I fixed one. Hey, one out of two ain't bad. So then Becky goes on and says that she's count here to fight. So then Lacey Evans' music hits, and then Lacey Evans comes out. Lacey goes on and says that Becky lets her emotions get the best of her. And then Lacey says that a true lady is always in control of her emotions. Here's the difference, Lacey. Becky's not a lady. She's the fucking man. Learn the difference, Jack. So then Lacey goes on and says that a lady has class. And Lacey goes on and says that she will beat the man like a true lady at Money in the Bank. Yes, this is when the matchup is happening. Becky versus Lacey Evans for the Raw Women's title at Money in the Bank. We don't know who's going to face Becky for the SmackDown Women's title. Because it's obvious Becky's going to go double duty at Money in the Bank. We're just got to wait and see what happens, dear. So then Becky goes on and calls Lacey a plaque. Huh, plaque. That's an interesting insult. I'm not sure what that means in Irish. You, someone's got to double check or show me the definition. Hey, I guess you know it's not weirdo or dopes. I guess. Eh, we'll just we'll just move on. So then Becky goes on and says that she'll dismantle Lacey Evans at Money in the Bank. And this leads into our next women's matchup, which is Becky Lynch versus the returning Alicia Fox. Are you fucking kidding me? Why the fuck is Alicia Fox still in this company after what happened? For fuck's sakes. WWE, you've learned nothing from what Alicia did. So let me get this straight. You'll fire Arn Anderson over that incident. Over that incident where Arn lets Alicia wrestle drunk. Or intoxicated in this case is the correct term. So you'll let... So you'll fire Arn for it. But you won't fire Alicia Fox for showing up to a show intoxicated. You've got to be kidding me. What the fuck is the excuse here? What the fuck am I missing here? What value does Alicia Fox bring? To where, hey... You can show up intoxicated to work and still have a job with no repercussions. Because Alicia pretty much refused going to rehab. She disappeared like a ghost. It's like, why is she still here? Why haven't you fired her yet? God damn it, WWE. This was your one chance to prove that you're a real company. And you blew it. You're not a real company. You're a fucking laughing stock. Like with this now... You're officially now the laughing stock of the entire wrestling industry around the world. Because now you sent the wrong message to everyone and all the other companies. Because because now everyone's going to be like, Hey, in WWE, you can show up to a show intoxicated and still compete. And still have a job with no repercussions. Because I'll tell you right here. If that was in a real company, a real wrestling company... Or at a or at a job in the workforce, a real job, 
Oh, if Alicia pulled that shit in any of those situations in a real company or a real job, Alicia would be fired right off the spot. My, because a lot of jobs have a zero tolerance policy on alcohol and drugs. Like, hell, WWE, wasn't the whole, like, don't you have a zero tolerance policy to that shit, too? That you put in effect when Eddie Guerrero died? So by having Alicia still compete, you know what this tells me? It tells me the policy doesn't mean a fucking thing. Then again, nothing in this company means fucking anything anymore, so what else is fucking shocking? So yeah, anyway, to the matchup, because I'm fucking done with this ranting shit. So then the matchup, highlights and Alicia fails in the match. Alicia selling throughout the match looked like shit. Honestly, it looked like the selling a fucking drunk would do. Like, Vince, did you check to see if Alicia Fox was intoxicated before coming out? Uh, Becky's head toss is good. Alicia would completely miss a drop kick. Uh, Alicia, go home. You're obviously drunk. Get the fuck out. Alicia stalling was weak. Obviously, she's intoxicated. She's hit the bottle one too many times. Becky's slotting drop kick was pretty good. Um, Alicia's strikes looked like crap. Alicia's headlock looked like shit. Becky could get out of that easily. Becky would then go and botch the head scissors. So whose fault is this? Is it Becky's or Alicia's? Take your pick, folks. LOL. Becky's flying forearm was good along with her two exploders. Match ending. Becky walks into this armor on the town was drunk bitch. Becky gets to tap out victory. So then after the match, Lacey Evans comes in the rain and then hits two women's rights on Becky Lynch for post-match assault. And Lacey Evans is standing tall. So yeah, making Lacey look strong so that when Becky retains, it will mean something at, after Money in the Bank. But yeah, please get Alicia Fox out. Get this talentless drunk diva out of this company. WWE, if you want to prove you're a real company, fire Alicia Fox. Show the entire roster and the entire industry that showing up to a show intoxicated is not going to be tolerated. Because by having her show up here tonight and compete, you're showing, hey, you can show up to the show intoxicated and still compete. So now you're saying that you'll tolerate showing up to a show intoxicated. Like, what's going to happen when someone shows up on cocaine or on crack? What's going to happen? But then again, WWE won't change anything until somebody dies in the rain. Like, literally, they won't change anything. Uh, they won't change a damn thing until somebody dies in the rain. And that's going to be a fucking sad way to make a change, to be perfectly honest. But yeah, Alicia Fox has returned to WWE. There's your WWE garbage moment of the week right there, folks. Automatic garbage moment of the week. It beats anything boring fuckface will do on Tuesdays. But yeah, we now got to deal with Alicia Fox on Mondays and Roman Reigns on Tuesdays. And when fuckboy Buckethead gets back, it will be on Mondays also. And to be honest with Alicia Fox, what has she done for the WWE lately instead of being a complete jobber? Like, she hasn't been in a meaningful feud in five years. Her last feud was in 2014 against Alicia Page, where Alicia was just putting Page over. So she was just putting the young talent over. So, in other words, Alicia hasn't had a meaningful run since, like, like her last meaningful, real meaningful run was 2010. Almost 10, almost 10 years ago. She hasn't had a meaningful run since. What has she done lately? Nothing. What value does she bring to the table? Nothing. Why is she still here? Because Vince McMahon has a hard on for Alicia Fox, I guess. What else do you want me to say? But anyway, continuing on. Next time we get to a one-on-one -on -one match, we get Ricochet versus Robert Roode. Formerly Bobby Roode. Bobby has now changed his name to Robert because he shaved his beard and has a mustache. And the mustache makes him look like Ravishing Rick Rude. Too bad the name isn't Ricky, so then we can call him Ravishing Ricky Rude. Nah, nah, that, no, that's too far. Alright, so then continuing on next, so to the highlights of the match. Ricochet's head scissor was good along with his drop kick and his overhead back body drop. 
Ricochet's moonsault is also good along with Robbie's vertical suplex. Ricochet's front roll drop kick and his head scissor was good along with Ricochet's pump kick and standing and shooting star press. Robbie's spine buster is good along with Ricochet's fireman's into a spinning knee. Pretty good sequence there. Match ending. Robert would roll, would have roll out of the way at the 630 splash. He'd hit the glorious DDT. I almost want to call it the Ravishy DDT since he does look like Rick Root. Almost look like Rick Root with that mustache on. But we'll call it the glorious DDT for now. So, Robert hits the glorious DDT. Robert gets the three count for the win. Well, I guess technically Bob is short for Robert. Because a lot of people that call, a lot of people like to call people, a lot of Roberts Bob for short as or like a nickname. Or Bobby. I uh, know. Interesting. But yeah. So continuing on, next up we get a segment. It's called Firefly Funhouse with Bray Wyatt. Oh my fucking god, this was terrible. Yeah, you want to know what my thoughts are in a Firefly Funhouse segment? Bray Wyatt's new gimmick? It fucking sucks. Like, Jesus Christ, what the fuck was that shit? Looked like a shittier version of Blue's Clues. And Pee Wee Herman's Adventure House rolled into a fucking blender. And this was the result of it. When we got as a result. Like, Jesus Christ, what the fuck was that shit? That's, that's fucking sucked. Like, if Alicia Fox didn't return... That, this could have been a contender for Garbage Moment of the Week. Like, goddamn, this segment sucks. I am not a fan of Bray Wyatt, this Bray Wyatt gimmick. Honestly, Bray Wyatt fucking deserves better than this. And you know what this proves? There is no more God. WWE killed Bray Wyatt. Rest in peace. I honestly like Bray Wyatt's last gimmick a hell of a lot better, but Vince found every way to waste him. Sad. Pity. Also, next week on Raw, we will have a moment of bliss with Alexa Bliss. And it will be the Money in the Bank edition. I'll probably know who most of the participants will be in both Money in the Bank matchups. And speaking of things not meaning anything, I can't wait for both the men's and women's Money in the Bank cash mat ladder matches. Can't wait to say, can't wait to see both Money in the Bank ca brief cash ins be failed cash ins. I think the women's is going to fail this year. And I imagine the men's is probably going to fail again for the third year in a row. Because like, you know what? Nothing fucking means anything in this company anymore. This poorly run car crash. But yeah, we'll rant about that next week. So I have to save my voice. So, now, so to end off Raw, we have our main event matchup. AJ Styles versus Boring Corbin. The winner faces Seth Rollins for the Universal title at Money in the Bank. Highlights of the match, AJ strikes are pretty good along with a sunset drop kick and a super kick. AJ sliding forearm was good along with his payway kick. You know, Baron's deep six is it, it's Baron. Like, once again, Baron only how only has a deep six in the end of days. Nothing else to offer on the table. AJ's cap crusher was pretty good too. Match ending, AJ hits the phenomenal forearm on Baron Corbin. AJ gets the three count for the win. So at Money in the Bank, it will be Seth Rollins versus AJ Styles at Money in the Bank. So it looks like the dream matchup is coming four mo three months earlier than expected. I thought this matchup was going to happen at SummerSlam. But I guess we're getting it now. Okay. So then after the match, Seth Rollins' music hits. Seth Rollins comes out to the ring. As Seth goes in, the, me the music stops. And then it comes back on and then dies down and then turns back up again. So we have obvious audio botches in the comedy, in the back in the production truck. It's like someone pressed the wrong button. Obviously, it's like honestly, whoever fucked that up needs to go home. They're obviously drunk too. I wonder if anyone in the production area had any of Alicia Fox's booze. I wouldn't want to drink anything Alicia Fox has, obviously. But yeah, continuing on. Seth and AJ both go, they both shake hands, and they both have a little stare down. So there is mutual friendship for now, but we all know come Money in the Bank, friendship is thrown out the window because it'll be every man for himself for that Universal title. And that's how we end Raw. Not gonna waste much time on the show rating. Show rating automatic 1 out of 10. If a... 
Only because it's only because we're getting the dream match of AJ Styles versus Seth Rollins. If we didn't get this dream match, I would have gave Raw a zero for Alicia Fox returning. Uh, fire Alicia Fox. If WWE wants to fucking prove they're a real company, fire Alicia Fox. Alright, show everyone. Showing up intoxicated will not be tolerated. But you fired Arn Anderson for it. What is Alicia Fox's excuse? I'll say it right here, Vince. If Alicia Fox is not fired by December 31st, 2019, I will stop watching WWE. And I will and it'll be for good. And I'm not joking this time. But yeah, that's another dumpster fire raw edition. Like this company shows they're once again a joke. It's crazy. 20 years ago, this company was the model co model wrestling company. In the wrestling industry. The premier company. It was where you would go to make a name for yourself. 20 years later. The indie scene is now where you go. To make a name for yourself. And WWE happens to be where you go. If you've already made a name for yourself. And you're just looking to make that extra moolah. Doesn't that sound familiar to you? Sound familiar to a daughter company that went out of business? It sure does to me. Because look, and it's obviously true because a lot of the talent that's come to WWE the last 10 years have been bona fide indie stars. Like the entire locker room is full of indie stars. So yeah. Yeah, this company is just a poorly run train wreck. Honestly, WWE, please do the right thing and release Sasha Banks so Sasha can go join a real company. Because it's obvious you do not deserve Sasha Banks. For wasting her too. So yeah. Please release Sasha Banks. And please fire Alicia Fox. I want Sasha to go be successful. In the indie scene. Like no wonder Dean Ambrose. Doesn't want to come back to this company. Like WWE is willing to. Overpay the shit out of Dean Ambrose. By offering Dean a, a contract. Multi year contract. Where Dean would be making 7 million a year. They were willing to overpay Dean. To keep him. And Dean said no. What does that tell you? Dean wants nothing to do with this company anymore. And oh, by the way, they just canceled Backlash. So yeah, that's fun. Because Backlash is a couple day weeks before um the next Saudi Arabia show. Because the next Saudi Arabia show is in June. And it's too close, so they're just going to cancel it. And they're also canceling all the house shows during that time. So yeah, anyone that lives in California... No WWE for you in June. Better luck next time. But yeah, I'm done with this rant. Hope everyone has a good day. Honestly, if you want unpredictability, go watch hockey or baseball. It's a lot more better and unpredictable than this bullshit. You can thank me later. Peace out.